Welcome to the Law of the Lord podcast, a production of the Newton Church of Christ in Newton, North Carolina. The aim of this podcast is to study God's Word for a deeper understanding and to see how it applies in our lives. Thank you for listening. We encourage you to search the Bible to see whether or not we are speaking truth, because the Bible is the truth. It is the law of the Lord. In this episode, we examine the idea that God is not really that strict. You see, some people view God like a gentle grandfather who sees no wrong in his grandchildren. This leads to misbehavior, that is, rebellion against God, that is, sin. We will study the scripture and see that while God is merciful and patient, he also has a definite standard to which he will hold us accountable. Again, thank you for listening, and please be sure to hit the subscribe button to be notified of new episodes. Also, we welcome your comments and questions at lawofthelord.com slash podcast. That's lawofthelord.com slash podcast. Now let's study the law of the Lord together. God is not that strict. Have you ever heard that? Me too. Dysfunctional, deceitful preachers have taught people God is more of a granddad than a father. They paint him as a happy-go-lucky, tender-all-the-time, kind of Santa Claus type of guy. He thinks you're cute even when you purposely stick the cat's tail in the fan, if you will. The problem is many are convinced of God's love, but not of his wrath. They see him as one who overlooks their minor faults, so-called, and is only really concerned about the big stuff, and that's what's going to get you in trouble. Don't worry about going to church each week, let alone every service. There's no problem with a little white lie now and then. He is not all that concerned how you worship or what church you go to so long as you believe in his son. That's the concept that many people have. He's just not a stickler. Well, the Bible definitely teaches that God is love. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, says, he does not love God, does not know God, for God is love. And we know that God loves the whole world. Remember John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He loved the world enough to send his son as a sacrifice. His patience and long-suffering are beyond our comprehension. Time and again, God extends mercy to us through his providence. We have to go around his mercy, really, to miss it. We have to purposely really reject it in our lives. The truth is nearly universally agreed upon in the fact that God is loving, God is merciful. That is, of course, among those who believe in God. But what people see differently is whether or not God is a stickler for details and is truly willing to hold people accountable for their sins. Will he really punish people in eternal torment? My feelings and your feelings are beside the point. What matters is what does the Bible say about it? When God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, he gave them only one rule. Don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in Genesis 2, verses 15 to 17. The punishment was spelled out for them, yet they transgressed God's command and ate of the fruit of the tree in Genesis 3, verses 1 through 6. At that time, Adam and Eve were separated from God. They no longer had fellowship with him because as Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2 say that our sins separate us from God. 
in 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, it says this, 1 John 1, verses 5 through 7, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You see, when Adam and Eve entered into darkness by violating the command of God, God could not have fellowship with him because God does not have fellowship with darkness. He only has fellowship with light. And so Adam and Eve, when they partook of that fruit, they broke their relationship to God. Now, think about this. What they did would be considered relatively minor to a lot of people. It's obvious, though, that this affected the couple as they tried to cover up and hide from God. But their attempt to hide from God was futile. Their attempt to cover up their sin was futile. God knew exactly what they did and pronounced punishments on the three who were involved. Eve was to have increased pain in childbearing, and Adam was to work by the sweat of his brow in unfavorable conditions. The serpent was cursed as well, of course. But Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden and thus cut off from the tree of life. So their physical bodies began to work toward death or head toward death, began to break down over time. Now, was God too cruel in meeting out the punishments to Adam and Eve, to the man and the woman? Was he too strict by asking them not to eat of the tree and then punishing them when they were simply trying to satisfy a curiosity? Was God just mean about all of this? Well, we dare not accuse God of such things. He laid down a law and he held them accountable to that law. When God gave them the command not to eat of the tree, he meant it. He is not man who wavers on decisions when the difficult time comes. He sticks to his word, and thankfully so. What hope would we have of his promised blessings if he did not keep his word on the punishments, the cursings? Jesus gave a parable to teach a lesson on forgiveness. I, I want to read this now from Matthew chapter 18. And let's, let's think about what he's saying on this idea of forgiveness in Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say up to you, to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 10, talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children, and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should be to pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? 
And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. You see, in this parable that the Lord gave, the wicked servant is punished for being unforgiving. Notice again what the text says in Matthew 18, 34. And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due him. Here is the picture. God is the master. We are the servants. If we do not forgive our fellow servants of the small things between us, God will not forgive us the massive debt we have before him. The consequences of us not being able to pay our debt is that we are delivered to the tortures until all is paid. The thing is, it will never be paid. We cannot pay it. Thus, all with an unforgiven debt will be tortured for all eternity. If this is not a true picture of the judgment in God's wrathful nature, then what is? It ought to frighten every one of us. The torture Jesus referred to in this parable is not being locked in a dark room with blaring music. The torture is that of being cast into a lake of fire and brimstone with the devil and his angels, as Revelation 20, 14, and 15 and Matthew 25, 41 speak about. Why will men be cast into this torment? Revelation 21, verse 8 says this, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Liars includes little white liars. Idolaters includes those who are covetous, as Colossians 3, 5 talks about. It also includes those who put golf, fishing, or anything else before service to God. Think of those who skip worship or Bible class on Sunday for their own pleasure. They go out to do their own thing, and they think, well, I can be closer to God in the woods, hunting, on the lake, fishing, on the golf course, swinging a club. They're lying to themselves. They're believing the destructive deceit of the devil. In Revelation 21, verse 8, the abominable includes those who disgrace and despise his son's blood by supporting and participating in churches not found in the Bible, in denominations and community churches, man-made religions that claim to love Jesus but do not follow his word. If God was willing to strike down Nadab and Abihu for using a different fire and Uzzah for simply trying to steady the ark, then he will be no less strict with us when it comes to judgment. You see, Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, where Jesus is delivering the Sermon on the Mount, he says there's a broad way that leads to destruction and a narrow way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. You see, there's a narrow way or a strict way that leads to eternal life. Remember Moses was kept out of the promised land for striking the rock instead of speaking to it in Numbers 20, verses 7 to 13. In Acts 5, Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead for misrepresenting their gift. The rich young ruler lacked one thing, according to Mark 10, 21 and 22. Think about what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Did he mean that? He has all authority, and with it commanded the apostles to teach all disciples to keep all the commands. What man is foolish enough to say, don't worry about it. God's not that strict. Not me, and I hope not you. 
Do not be deceived by the devil and by the lie that God will simply give you a pass on the judgment day because he's really not that strict. Be sincere. Be dedicated. Be a student of God's word so you can know his will and be determined to live by it. Thank you for listening to the Law of the Lord podcast, a work of the Newton Church of Christ in Newton, North Carolina. Find out more about us and access more study material on our website at lawofthelord.com. That's lawofthelord.com. Reach out to us with any questions or comments about this episode. We also welcome Bible questions that we can answer personally for you or address on a future episode. We look forward to hearing from you.